All right, I think we will get started. We can uh, do introductions and uh, hopefully everyone will, will have joined or wants to join after, after that point. So uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, Odyssey DevCon afternoon session. This is the Odyssey Broadsea 3.0 introduction. We've got uh, G Long Londi here, here and um, myself, Lee Evans. And uh, I think I'll just go first briefly introduce myself. I've been um, part of the Odyssey for about seven or eight years now. I'm one of the collaborators. Uh, one of my contributions to Odyssey is to create an easier way to install uh, the Odyssey tool. So that was Broadsea, and it's evolved over time. We'll talk a little bit about how it's evolved. And uh, I hope we'll get into the specifics of uh, you know, the Docker installs and how to get everything up and running. But uh, Ajit, I know you're going to do a great demo for us today, so you're going to show that. Um, OK, so John's back. I think we will get started. Uh, Ajit, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so, hi, everybody. My name is Ajit Lunde. Um, I work at Boringer Ingelheim. Um, I've been involved in the Odyssey community for a, a while now, um, 10 years, I don't know, <laughs> something close to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think um, part of the reason that I, I wanted to kind of help with the Broadsea effort is um, you know, I've been seeing challenges, whether I've, whichever company I've worked at uh, with standing up these tools, uh, and also I've been very sympathetic with uh, everyone in the forums trying to struggle through it. So um, I was hoping to kind of um, add some things I learned recently. Uh, honestly, my Docker knowledge is very recent, but um, I was hoping to sort of add some of those uh, capabilities to the stack and, and try to make it uh, so that we can kind of get to that uh, ease of installation that, that Lee mentioned. And I would just say that uh, we're doing this presentation today with Broadsea 3.0 because of Ajit. It's uh, his effort. There may be a couple of other people involved as well on that. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to talk about kind of the history and, and where we are. Uh, and then Ajit's going to show his great work that he's, he's been uh, contributing to Odyssey. All right, let me. OK, so what is Broadsea? Because there may be people on the call that, that have no idea what it is <laughs> and it has sort of had a low profile within odyssey as well and uh i think it's probably the right time now to to sort of say this is broadsea is the easiest way to install the odyssey tools and um, and also to upgrade the tools so if you want to keep up with the new releases broadsea is i, I think the uh, odyssey recommended approach uh to do that um if now there is one dependency and that is that you're able to use docker and Docker Engine, uh, Docker Desktop, one of those uh, ways of running Docker containers. So um, I guess uh, a Docker image, if, if you're not familiar with Docker, it's it's basically a way of, of um, packaging together all of the, the dependencies, the pieces that would say make up the Atlas Web API application into a single image. Uh, it, it's on a public site, so it's Docker Hub. is a site where you can go and download the image for Atlas Web API, for example. Um, and then if you have Docker installed on a Mac or a Linux or Windows, then you're able to easily uh, you know, just do like a, a single command and bring up the applications. So uh, I, I, I also want to say that there are different ways of installing Odyssey tools. Broadsea is one way to do it. It's not the only way. So if you want to use um, Odyssey on AWS in the cloud, perfectly fine, great way to do it. Um, if you want to, uh, I guess, install everything from scratch, you want to install the Java JDK and Python and all the other pieces, that's perfectly fine as well. But this is just the idea of let's make it simple for people and so we can get more people involved creating evidence using these amazing Odyssey tools. So, so the idea with version one was just to do that. So we had Web API, Atlas Web API and RStudio with the, at that time wasn't even called Hades R packages, but is now known as Hades. And uh, that's that's been up and running probably for five or six years. That's that's been an option. I would say that some of the challenges around it were keeping the images up to date as new releases came out. So um, that was something I think we really fixed in in version two. So so version two came out I think the end of last year or just the start of this year, and it gave us a, some other benefits. So so one thing is that. Uh, it, it hooked into the automated build of Atlas and Web API. 
So uh, we're automatically getting the latest versions of, of Atlas and Web API now. So that was a really big benefit that's probably transparent to most people. Uh, the other thing I did, and I worked on too, so uh, the other thing I did was I, I did a lot of work to create uh, a, a default demo Postgres database image. So there's definitely some, it, it's a little challenging to get a database up and running for the first time, a, a OMOP CDM database. And, and what a lot of people wanted to do, I think, was just say, I want to try this tool out. I want to get Atlas Web API running uh, on some little CDM database just to see what it looks like. And that was actually quite difficult to do because of that database issue. So uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do it because of a, uh, when you create an, an OMOP CDM database, certain things have to be in place. Like the certain tables have to be populated and then you kind of have to stop the database and you have to insert some more information into some other tables. It's quite, um, you know, it's a, a lot of work to do that. So I did figure out a way how I could pre-populate that database. So it's just as easy now as just bringing up the database. So broadly, we'll... I, I got to jump in, Lee, and just yep. echo that 1,000%, and you can't emphasize enough how hard it used to be to manually set up that database, especially that part where it, like, is the snake eating its tail, yes. and you have to set it up, get it running, run it, see it fail, get that script, run the script, start it up. It was a nightmare, so thank you so much for this tool. Um, I, I just couldn't okay. hold, contain myself. Sorry, I'll go away now. Bye. No, that's fine. Feel free. Anyone can chip in. It's fine. Um, so, so the nice thing about that as well is it's got some data in it. So we got Unomia, like a, a, a subset of, of data. It's very small, but it's enough to get uh, people up and running. And you can do a demo, right? So in five, 10 minutes, you can see data in Atlas, which I think is important to, to get people excited about it. Uh, now, there are ways that uh, you can go from that demo database to a full-blown um, CDM database. And uh, I think really I think, Ajit, what you've done in version three is really make that possible uh it was it was kind of uh hidden knowledge before to, to be able to do it uh, but now it's it's really clear and so you know thanks for that uh so let's let's go on to version three so uh ajit's going to talk about all the new uh services the new abilities of free i'm i'm really impressed with it um so we've got some slides to, to talk about that but in general uh, there's a uh, reverse proxy that's uh, much more extensive and uh, supports SSL, which is a huge benefit. You know, we really, it was really difficult to set that up before. Now it's it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, it's, AG had the idea of an environment variable driven deployment. So you can really sort of mix and match and, and pick what applications you want. He's in, uh, covered a lot more Odyssey tools than were available previously. Um, and then the, the really nice part here is if you want to build your Docker image from Git, you can do that as well. So, you know, if you're maybe just doing some, you want to get the development build and you want to grab that, you can now do that. So great work. Um, the, the simple, you know, one line command here, there is still just a one line command to bring up the sort of default uh, applications is Docker Compose. And then you've got profile and, and it's the default profile. And you just want to run it in the background, so it's set up um, dash D. So I, I put that in there because that really is all you need. You can pull down the, the Docker images, but it will do it itself. Um, and then you'll have a working Atlas. <laughs> so now the last thing at the bottom of there is that we have the uh, GitHub repo. And uh, you know, we're obviously welcome to have people submit issues, test things out. This is, I should say that uh, 3.0 is brand new. I think, um, when did we do the release? Did you, we did it yesterday. <laughs> Wednesday or Thursday, I can't remember which. Okay, yeah. So um, it, so we will, we do expect to see some issues uh, in some places, and, and it will get better in the next week or two, but uh, we definitely have enough uh, stable uh, features, functionality to share with you today. And then the last thing, I don't have... Uh, like any stats on the current downloads, like the latest version, obviously, you know, version two has been out there for a while, like I said, this year, but I don't have stats on that, but I do have the original one, which is still out there from version one. And we've got on Docker Hub, uh, I think it's the Web API tools or Broadsea tools that have been downloaded, downloaded over 10,000 times. So it definitely has had some traction. People have been interested in using uh, Broadsea. 
Okay, broad C 3.0. And and Ajit, feel free to to jump in and and if I miss anything here, that's or something that's not clear. Uh, so what I've tried to show is I like to use the Odyssey colors because this is you know it's an Odyssey approved approach for deploying everything. This is open source. Uh, we have support for a number of applications. I guess it's going to grow over time, and we have support for some uh, supporting capabilities for those applications. So we we talked a little bit at the bottom here. Uh, we got Atlas DB. So this is that demo uh, OMOP CDM database that's populated with Unomia. And so that's one uh, container, Docker container that's running now. It's a Postgres database. Then uh, we have some optional pieces, right? So above that, uh, I've got the Solar Search Index. So Solar is, um, it's a way of speeding up in particular search capability. So if you want to look up a particular concept in uh, Atlas, then you will, if you have a large, well, I guess the concept table itself is pretty large and concept relationships. So um, it really will uh, speed up searches of, of concepts within Atlas. And, and we're talking probably down to under a second, maybe. I'm not sure I haven't benchmarked it recently compared to maybe you know, four or five seconds or maybe even more uh, on some other systems. So uh, now I should say that all of this can run on the server. It can run on your laptop. Um, I mean, it doesn't quite run on a, a Raspberry Pi. We didn't get to that point, uh, but it, it does. Um, it scales up pretty well. I think if you have good uh, hardware on the server, uh, but it's also small enough to install on a laptop just to dry it out. So another great piece. Now this is really new. So um, did, you, did you want to talk about vocabulary import? Uh, sure. Yeah. So there's um, there's a method to uh, basically take the um, CSV files that you download from Athena, um, because right now there's no programmatic access to to Athena. So you can download those files, um, and usually the process is kind of um, you know a bit annoying. You know you have to yeah. load it into your database uh, platform. You need to actually before that you may need to run the CPT. Um, batch file in order to actually convert the CPT names uh, if you have that UMLS um, key. Uh, and so basically uh, this service uh, takes care of that. You point to a folder that has those um, CSV files. Uh, you provide the UMLS key uh, and it just does the rest um, only for Postgres though. So we, we kept it limited in scope to just to do that for a Postgres instance. It could be a Postgres instance from Broadsea here, or it could be a Postgres instance that you have someplace else in your network. Um, so that yeah. that's the uh, the purpose of the vocab import. Uh, and then the piece next to it, the Phoebe um, file load. Um, this is something that is really exciting. The Phoebe um, work that um, uh, Anna Stroplitz and, and Patrick and other folks in, in Columbia University in particular um, have led and and with the um, integration in Atlas with, uh, with uh, from Chris. Um, this is something that we we're all excited about, but I, I think you know we we did it's not as simple to pull to kind of integrate um, for sites yet. Um, and so we wanted to do some sort of service here where uh, you can get that file and actually that file sits in our repo um, for now. We may change that in the future. Uh, and it can load that Phoebe table, the concept recommended table in, uh, so that if you wanted to have in your Atlas instance, the ability to um, have recommended concepts given to you as you're building a concept set, uh, it can do that. Um, so if, you, if you've not heard of that work, um, I highly recommend uh, taking a look at the Phoebe project uh, and also the release notes for Atlas 2.12, I believe it was, and above. Um, and this is just a, an enabler of that. Yeah, it's, it's a great um, to add on, I would say, to, to Atlas. So it was a separate tool and it was integrated into Atlas, as you said. Um, it, it's really going to improve studies. You know, it's going to recommend additional concept sets or concepts within a concept set that uh, you should take a look at and decide if you want to include or not. So, um, it, but as also, it's been difficult to kind of say, well, where do you get that data set from? It's kind of in an obscure place at the moment, and now it's in the repo. You can um, use Broadsea just to pull it in and say, that. I do think you have to create the table to support it. That's the one thing in the database. Uh, the vocabulary import is really, really important, really useful. So uh, the demo database has a very, very limited 
set of uh, concepts and vocabulary because we wanted to keep it small and, and fast for people to demo with. So, you know, the majority, you know, 95, 99% of the concepts are missing from that demo database. So being able to import them into you know, the real concepts into that database or your own database, even better, production database is great. Um, so we've got Atlas Web API. So Web API is the sort of REST-based services that support the Atlas front end um, web applications. Uh, we've got RStudio Hades. And the benefit there with uh, this RStudio, it's actually RStudio server, it's a community edition, and we install all of the, the Hades R packages into it. So it's all you know ready to go. <laughs> it started up and, and it, um, you can start using the packages. And that, again, is another area where it's, it's really quite complex, difficult to get all of the Hades packages installed. Maybe it's a little easier since I've done it uh, a year or two ago, but uh, it's just a lot of dependencies there. You've got you know, Java and Python. Um, I don't know what else is, is that there to install and different uh, versions as well. So it, sometimes with version incompatibilities between packages, not within Hades now, but maybe across if you're using maybe some shiny applications as well. So having that just as a Docker image, you can start up with Broadsea is really helpful. And then Ares, I think, is, is a relatively new application. I know Frank worked on it. Um, I think the idea is that you can see changes to your uh, CDM data over time. So it's kind of a data quality application. I don't know if you want to add anything um, to that, Ajit. Yeah, it's, I think it's sort of like a network level, um, summary level statistic and data quality and data feasibility um, application. Um, and so it's um, been definitely talked about, but I feel like it's still a little bit underused at this point uh, in the community. Um, I'm excited about it because I think that there's um, great potential, especially with the, the feasibility analyses of being able to see which data sources can um, have a chance of answering your study question within your network. Um, so that that's relatively new. There's still some some bugs to iron out there, certainly as we sort of get this integrated. But um, at least the web application uh, is there, and you can mount your data files um, into it. Yeah, I think um, you have to run an R package to generate the data from it uh, to get those uh, mm -hmm. files. Yeah, it's like Achilles, a combination of Achilles uh, data quality dashboard and Aries indexer. Um, so we'll, I'll, meant, I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of like future um, enhancements to this stack so that it makes it easier to, to handle that. Okay, excellent. All right, I'm going to move a little bit quicker now so because uh, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for the demo. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. So uh, there's just, I, I'm, I really love 3.0 because now, uh, you know, the support for, as we said, SSL on the uh, routing side of things, on the proxy, but uh, there's, through configuration, you can much more easily set up, you know, your security provider. Um, there's different Docker profiles you can choose. It supports all the Odyssey supported databases. So it's, um, you know, you have to have a Postgres database for your application, like for Atlas. Um, now you can, if you wanted to, you can use the, the demo image to do that. But what I would probably recommend is to export if you want to you know, use the setup that's within that demo database, export it out as a, a database dump and then load it into your real production uh, Postgres database. If you're on AWS and it's probably an RDS service. Uh, so it supports all the you know, large databases as well, just because uh, you know, it's using all the Odyssey uh, database connector and things like that. So you, know, you can run things on, uh, I know Snowflake, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, um, Databricks, uh, it's expanding all the time, so it's cool. And then this is all driven by that uh, .env file. And I think the next slide, let me see. Oh, decided not to move, there it is. Um, I think this is where we're gonna switch over and Ajit, uh, you're gonna take us through some of these slides. Sure, um, so I'm, I'm just gonna uh, share my screen actually now. Oh, um, sure. And um, we'll just um, kind of bring up these slides real quick. So um, the the way that we built this was we wanted uh, sort of this ability to pick things a la carte, so like ordering from a menu, basically. So we have um, 
different profiles, and this is all laid out in the uh, the GitHub uh, I/O page um, for Broadsea. But I thought I might just kind of distill it down here in a couple slides. Um, you have the ability to run the default profile, which gives you Atlas Web API, um, the Atlas DB, you know that Postgres instance that Lee mentioned, uh, the Hades uh, R Studio uh, image, uh, and also you get a splash page so that when you go to your um, your hosts, you know, root URL, you see a little splash page that shows you the different applications. Um, you could go in different ways, like if you want it to be more specific and maybe have certain things turned on, certain things turned off, or maybe you're doing some, some development work. So Atlas and Web API, you can uh, choose to pull from image. And what that means is it's going to pull the standard uh, image from Docker Hub that is, has been published, you know, releases get published out there. Um, and so the other approach that uh, is there is if you wanted to build Atlas or and Web API from a specific Git repo, a branch, a commit, whatever it might be, uh, now you can actually do that. Um, one of the things that's nice about Docker Compose um, 3.x is that you can actually build, you know, in your Docker Compose, you can have services that instead of pulling a pre-built image, you can actually point it to a Git repo and it'll build it on the fly and, and basically give you um, that image and it acts like an image from there. Um, Atlas DB, if you again, this is if you're just pulling things all the cart, you could choose to have it build that Atlas DB, the Postgres instance. Um, so that's if you don't have an existing Postgres instance, but you could, you know, point to an existing Postgres uh, instance with your web API schema. Um, as Lee mentioned, you know, in terms of going to a production kind of instance, um, it's probably better not to have a Postgres um, instance running just as a Docker container. You're probably better off using something like Amazon RDS um, or some other kind of system. Um, so you can point to that if you already have that in place. Uh, the solar vocab, uh, we have two kind of approaches here. Either you can say, well, I want to, I want to launch the solar instance um, on this uh, host, and I don't want it to perform the import of the vocabulary. Uh, because with solar, you are um, creating a, a uh, an indexed search off of your concept and concept relationship tables so that it's faster and snappier uh, for the end user in Atlas. So you can take two approaches. You can say, just, just give me the solar uh, console. I'm not going to uh, have you run the import. Or you can have it actually run the import as well off of a um, vocabulary schema. Then there's other options here, profiles, Aries. So I mentioned that that web application is there now, so you could um, choose to uh, deploy it. It's not part of the default profile just because it's still a little bit on the new side and, and you know, it's not fully as fully mature as the other applications. Um, you can decide to use or not use the content page, the splash page that I mentioned. Um, and actually we just, Sorry, <laughs> I forgot to change that in the documentation. It's actually just available at the root. Um, and then the OMOP vocabulary, you can choose to load it, um, as we, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, and the Phoebe table as well. Um, so really what you want to do is you want to decide which of these profiles do I want in my deployment, and that's going to then govern how you write your environment variable file. Um, so the, the environment variable file, there's 12 sections in it. And so that, that's one of the other kind of changes is aside from having an environment variable file, which is nice because you can kind of author up everything and just point to it and then have it deploy things. Um, one of the, the, the changes that I, I made really just because it's hard to follow along otherwise is create sections. So you'll see that in the uh, templated ENV file that's in your in Broadsy, you'll see these 12 sections in it. And so once you figure out all of your profiles that you're, you actually want to use, you can go section by section and fill out the uh, pertinent details. Um, so for instance, you know, if you're in section one, you're filling out, what's my host name? Um, in this case, I'm running this as just a, a local uh, installation. So it's just going to be my local host. Um, what's the architecture of your uh, system? Um, in my case here, I, I, have, I have a Mac Silicon based computer, so I would change this to Linux ARM64. Some services uh, have to run via emulation, and so those are kind of hard coded as such. Um, there's HTTP, uh, whether you want to enable um, uh, SSL. Um, so in that other slide, we showed that um, there's this traffic proxy. So this actually acts as sort of the um, really the interface with sort of the, the external um, 
um, clients that you're working with, everything within it is just running as little containers, but this handles all the routing and SSL, whether you decide to use that or not. Uh, and so you go section by section, and I guess I, I don't want to belabor each section. You can kind of follow along as you um, kind of read through it, but you have the ability to set up Atlas security. Um, there's different environment variables depending on the type of uh, security provider you use. Um, there's um, if you want to set a specific uh, user account for the Hades um, R Studio service. Uh, right now, it's just a single user R Studio server, so that's something we may look at in the future to um, improve. Uh, you can set up the vocab import um, options that I mentioned. With um, um, if you want to. You know, import the CSVs into a Postgres instance. What are the details there? The Phoebe table, where are you loading that? Um, Ares, Ares is an application that requires exported uh, files. Where are those data files going to live? Uh, and then very lastly, just what applications are, do you want to show on the splash page? Is it Ares, Atlas, Hades, none of the above, all of the above? Um, so that's where you can determine that. Hey, uh, G, um, so, I, I see we've oh, got sure. a question from, from John, and I, I think sure. maybe we should just pause a little bit and just open it up for people to ask questions if they can unmute themselves when they ask a question. Go ahead, hey, John. Ajit. Again, thank you so much for this. I'm I'm so excited about this, and, and it's just such a great tool. Um, I see the section where I can change my web API database. I'm not seeing where I can point to the CDM database. Did I miss it? Yeah, so the CDM databases that's handled through the usual means of um, adding sources into Atlas. Um, so when once you stand up your Atlas instance, uh, then there's two methods for adding a CDM source to it. Um, one is if you've got security enabled, use the configuration page there and use the add new source um, GUI that's there. That's the cleanest approach. If you don't have security enabled, then you'll need to go into the source and source daemon tables um, in uh, the web API schema to then add the information for that CDM source. Um, and so it's not something that's handled in broad C today as any sort of pattern. Um, but I do think that we may get there because uh, CDM source management um, can be um, a bit of a challenge. You know, obviously the whether it's the post processing of Achilles and DQD and so forth. Um, or it's the you know preparing the results tables that are needed for that CDM. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about for the future. Um, but for now, um, it's not a pattern that you establish that you use here in Broadsea. You just kind of use the standard approach in Atlas to do that. Okay. And uh, by so the way, quick question. Sorry to interrupt. Just on that, is the default behavior of Broadsea security enabled or security disabled? It, it's security it security disabled. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's just checking. So the whole statement about going to administer data sources that implies security is enabled, I think. So uh, just something to be aware of. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. it, it's reasonable though, because uh, if you're starting to use a real production CDM database, you probably should start to be security enabled. And then once it is security enabled, just go into the admin page with an atlas and it's very simple to add that source. And I, I'm at that admin page in Atlas is going to tell me uh, how to set up my security. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to set up a Databricks instance here. So I have uh, it's going to it's going to take a JDBC uh, connection parameter and it's going to take a token uh, as my password and all, all that's in the Atlas documentation. Right. So I mean, I'll 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 just kind of show just briefly just for that question, and also you're seeing my Atlas instance that I was going to show. Um, so you, if you have security enabled, you click on new source, uh, and then here you put in all the pertinent details. You can say I want to use um, my uh, Apache Spark dialect. Um, I want to call it a certain key. Put my connection string, my user password, and then the daemons, the CDM vocabulary and results. Uh, and in the case of Databricks, you will need a temp. Um, daemon as well, since there's no such thing as temp tables and Databricks. Um, so th this is the interface that we're talking about. Um, it's um, pretty straightforward and, and it, it's the cleanest approach so that, um, you know, you, you don't miss any of the details in, in the source table. Okay, I think okay. if could people raise their hands if they have additional questions? It, it would be real helpful to me if someone could drop a link to where the documentation for all of that is. Is it in the uh, Book of Odyssey? Um, don't remember if it's there. Um, 
Maybe a good opportunity to add it there. That would be a good place. <laughs> Sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> All right. Any uh, sorry, more questions? documentation for, for the web API configuration? Is that what you're asking? For how yeah, to configure your new data source. This, this sure, page, I will okay. drop a link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Okay. I just can remember offhand if there's something. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Sorry. Then I'll shut up. Okay. I think I think we'll move on. And then if, if people have questions, just raise your raise your hand on the, the app. Okay, so the the demo the demonstration we sort of got into a little bit, but basically um with um with my uh, deployment that I have here, um, so you can see that I've got containers um, in Broad C, um, and some of them I've turned off uh, for various reasons. But basically, with my Broad C implementation, I've got several containers here in green um, that I've established by using the profiles and using the environment uh, file. Uh, so you can see I've got the Atlas DB since running this locally. I just want a Postgres instance uh, to be stood up and uh, have the Web API schema and um, have my vocabulary and all the other um, items I need. I've got a content service, which is really just a splash page. Um, I've got a solar instance. Um, I've got the, the traffic um, proxy that we discussed before. This is really doing a lot of the um, like sort of the magic of SSL and uh, routing. Um, and then there's Hades. Um, I'm previewing, thanks to uh, some of the work from uh, Sanjay and McClellan, uh, the uh, LDAP, uh, being able to stand up a little LDAP instance so you could test out security. Uh, and I've got Atlas, Ares, and Web API. Uh, so how I actually got here was uh, I made a another environment variable uh, file. I called it env local. Uh, and I did this just because I wanted to make sure I didn't check this in um, into Git. Uh, but you can see here that I went through each of the sections. Um, I established that I wanted to use SSL. Uh, to do SSL, you'll need to get a certificate. And then once you get a certificate, uh, you'll need to create a, a cert file and a key file and then place those in a folder and call each of them broadc.crt uh, and broadc.key. Um, and that's all laid out in the readme here, as you can see. Uh, if you go to the advanced usage um, section, you can see that um, it specifies for SSL, obtain a CRT and key file, rename them, and then place them into a folder and make sure that you point to that folder in your environment file so it knows to mount those particular uh, files. Um, so I, I, I did that, and so very quickly I was able to get SSL up and running, probably the quickest I've ever gotten SSL running in many years of trying. Um, so I thought that was um, a nice feature to have. And it's also something not only on my local machine, but I've also gotten it to work in my for my company. I have a dev server here. It's got SSL running. Uh, and it was very simple just by getting that file and um, actually um, mounting those file the, those two files. Uh, it works very simply. Um, so again, fastest I've ever gotten that to work. <laughs> um, and so Atlas, the then there's some sections here on how you want to establish uh, you know your atlas um, configuration um, there's some web api details um, so this is interesting because you don't have to use the postgres uh, database that's that comes with broad c that's something that we had sort of before 3.0 uh, and people are asking well i've got this other postgres instance how do i point to that now you can do that uh, and so for instance in my uh, company's uh, deployment i'm using an a, uh, an rds postgres that's external certainly um, to that to that system um, security provider so I, I in this case on my local machine i do have a, a local ldap uh, running and so i'm able to specify that i'm using uh, ldap uh, and so you'll when it comes to security you have to kind of configure it both on the atlas side and on the web api side you can't just do one or the other so you need to specify, you know, what the provider type is and, and so forth. Um, and then also, hey, as we were you, just calling out. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I see Chris has his uh, hand raised. Yep. Oh, sure. um, Chris? There's one element that I um, wanted to ask you about uh, before you jumped on. You had the data source username and password. Um, there are actually two database username and passwords in, in Web API. Uh, one mm -hmm. is an administrative one that lets you deploy migrations and alter tables and change stuff. Um, 
that's the flyway migration. And then the second mm -hmm. one is just the general user that um, does general read, update, delete permissions on existing tables. And so um, not I did, not to throw any cold water on anything, um, I'm assuming since you're only asking for one username and password, you're probably using the same account for both the admin and the user, mm -hmm. which is fine, but we split those up because one has elevated privileges compared to the other. So just okay. some feedback, maybe uh, add an admin, like a web API admin username and password for, you know, and use that for the admin. Okay. That's all. Yep. Didn't want to no, lose that. We'll add that, <laughs> we'll, we'll add that in as a uh, enhancement. Um, I did use the same for both. Um, and so I think um, establishing the del delineation between the two uh, so that is clear uh, and then having those um, available in the environment file uh, will be an enhancement to make. Um, sure. So yeah, I did, I did kind of short circuit that just by using the one. Gotcha. All right. No problem. Thanks. That's good. Just Thanks, Chris. That. No That's good feedback. Um, right. So in terms of uh, web API security, you will need to change um, the term from disabled security to Atlas regular security. So now this is getting into the web API side. What is the security provider you're going to use? Uh, and so we do provide uh, all of the um, variables, environment variables for all providers that are in the POM file for Web API, um, and it, it's exposed. You don't have to fill out the ones you're not using. You you just you could just leave them as is. Um, the LDAP uh, provider is the one that I used, and so here I've um, entered in this little you know uh, containerized LDAP uh, in order to kind of demonstrate. Um, and so there are multiple providers here. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with. Most of them really just LDAP and Active Directory. Uh, so these other provider types, you know, I guess what I'm saying is there may be some bugs there to, to iron out. So please do if you if you are using any other provider types that aren't LDAP or Active Directory, um, let us know if there's uh, things we need to change with those. We really just kind of took the environment variables from the POM file for Web API. Uh, this section here is, is I, I decided not to run from image. I decided to just, or excuse me, I decided to run from image rather than running from a specific Git URL. But you can see how you could, you know, when when 2.13 was uh, in a release candidate and it wasn't out yet, there wasn't a Docker Hub image for it. So I wanted a way to be able to, to test things out. Like Chris had a couple of enhancements for Redshift, uh, bug fixes for Redshift, and I wanted to be able to test it without setting up a whole development environment. And so I added this method here where you could actually point to uh, a specific branch just by using the GitHub URL and putting a hashtag and then the um, tag. Uh, and so that was a that that was a feature that uh, you don't necessarily need to use. It's just depending upon your use case. If you'd like to try out a very specific um, commit or a branch, then this allows you to do that. Uh, solar, so I stood up solar, um, and so I, I'm using the default um, kind of uh, URL uh, for solar that comes from Broadsea. But if you did stand up solar someplace else, uh, you can point to that as well. Uh, and so you, if you are using um, Broadsea to launch solar vocab, uh, you'll need to provide some details here. Uh, and again, this is in the readme file, so it does kind of expand upon this a bit, but you'll need to provide the version of vocab so you know what to call it. Um, the uh, JDBC path and uh, driver path and details you'll need in order to actually uh, to run the data import where you actually build the solar core that's also needed here. Uh, and so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll push forward a little bit here. Um, just again, I think we're running probably a little over. Um, so in order to actually run this, what I, what I did was I ran different commands. Uh, so essentially Docker Compose uh, and that you can specify a different env file if you want to. That's what I'm doing, just so that I don't um, accidentally commit uh, the wrong file. Um, if you're just using the env file that you cloned, you, you don't have to include this little parameter here. Uh, and then you specify profile, and then the name of the profile, and then up d. Uh, and so you could, if you wanted to, just get everything that um, is specified in the default profile, which is really um, I think we discussed uh, Atlas, Web API, the database, Hades, and a splash page. Uh, you would just run simply this command. Uh, you you certainly would want to make sure you you touch the environment file and set up the things you wanted to, uh, but that's all you would need uh, to actually get it up and running. 
If you want to be more specific and maybe add some other services on top, like the solar vocab or Aries, then you can do that as well. And so what that uh, kind of gives us ultimately is. Um, could, could I interrupt you just for a second? Because I just wanted to make sure. one point it might not be obvious, but that demo database uses Docker volumes. So when you bring it down and bring it back up, it will retain all the data that's in there. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I'm glad it does because <laughs> yeah. I've definitely brought it down several times. Uh, yep, and so that's that's a key point. We should probably, uh, if it's not in the readme already, probably mention that um, as well. Um, were there other questions? Sorry, I know I'm kind of going fast here. Well, I think we have some extra time. Uh, uh, the, the call is scheduled through till 3 o'clock uh, US time, Eastern time. Oh, I see. But um, I think we probably were planning to do maybe uh, finish in maybe another half an hour. So it's plenty of time. OK, um, so this is the deployment then, right? So I've got um, my splash page oh, 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 because oh, oh, I opted. I, I, I did have a question. I remembered it, but I forgot it. Um, OK, okay. sorry about that. <laughs> I'm a little uh, or so. So there's CDM, there's Web API, but there's also the uh, Achilles tables, the Achilles schema. Um, mm -hmm. Is the recommendation, so like I said, I'm doing my CDM and Databricks, is the recommendation to keep the Achilles tables in the Docker schema, or is the recommendation to try and implement that in Databricks as well? And I'm hoping it's A, because I think A is going to be a lot easier, but am I going to have, is there a recommendation on that? So the Achilles tables are, uh, can, should be in your result schema for that CDM. Um, so it's actually going to be on Databricks in your case. Oh, it's in it's um, it, the the Achilles tables are in, in CDM. Yeah, okay. so like for instance, um, you know, I've got um, let's take the Unomia one. Um, the Unomia one has your CDM schema, uh, and then also I've got a, a results schema, uh, and so that results schema needs to have your Achilles tables uh, because that's going to be used by Atlas uh, to actually serve up the data sources reports. Uh, and also the person counts and record counts and so forth. Um, so when you run Achilles, it's it really doesn't need to point to your web API scheme in any way. In this case, I've got it all running on one database. But uh, in, in your case, you know, you can have your Postgres running web API uh, and then your Databricks CDMs, uh, you know, they stay in Databricks. You uh, create your result schema. You run your Achilles uh, packaged in order to get these tables. You will then also need to deploy results tables um, from Atlas, which is currently not handled by Broadsea, uh, but you would um, establish those tables. And once you've got all that, then you have a viable CDM for Atlas. So, um, that last part went by a little quick. So you said that the results tables are not handled by Broad C, wouldn't they? Again, I'm a little confused at where they live. I haven't looked at it in a while. So the results are in CDM. And so uh, Broad C deploys with a demo database. I'm assuming that those, those tables are or are not in that demo da database. They, they, they are in the demo database. Okay, I, I think okay. Ajit was saying that um, it won't create the results tables for you in your new right, database. Right, right. And uh, you'd have to download that DDL from an Atlas instance. Is it that DDL yeah. is not part of the CDM DDL? No, no, it is a no. different separate DDL. Uh, there's another slide somewhere, but just recognize that um, the reason why, if I may <laughs> say, why we haven't, sure. uh, why it just isn't a responsibility of Broad C. It's also not a responsibility of Web API. Uh, no, I get you, it. I get it. You you create your own ETL process to get your source data into CDM format. And if you want to use it in Web API for an analytics, you must also create the necessary result schema and do your own custom permissions and whatever whatever tasks that we could not possibly automate for you for getting I that. Get it. However, I get it. not being critical. Yeah, okay. No, no, I'm not saying you are. I'm okay. saying uh, I thought it was clear. I thought I needed to explain like why you're scratching your head in a way that makes me think like you weren't clear on why these things are happening. But when you set up a CDM that you want to use with Atlas, you have to set it up completely, meaning you have to create a CDM schema with ETL and a result schema to store generated results. Once right, that's all right. there, you can go into the Atlas UI and direct Atlas to point to it by creating those records in the source table. Yeah. So the the yeah. the all this all it's a, it is definitely a user manual process to set up a CDM and that includes a result schema. 
Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I, I just haven't looked at it in a while. So if I'm recalling correctly, there's that there's the Achilles R script. Will that create those tables, or I I, for, I forgot how I the created Achilles those script. Tables. So this is, I guess, an interesting point because it's a chicken and the egg problem. Achilles came before Atlas. <laughs> um, so Achilles writes results to its own result schema. Atlas will view those results and give you pretty reports if you store those results in the same result schema that that Atlas looks for for its results. So there's a little bit of an overlap there between a result schema that Achilles assumes and a result schema that Web API assumes. And Web API adopted to use the Achilles results directly just for simplicity's sake because Atlas uh, Achilles preexisted, so we're like, eh, all right, bring in bring in the Achilles results. Achilles can run its results into its own schema if it wants, and it will create a schema in its own Achilles result schema. But Atlas cannot point to that schema. There's no way to say this is the Achilles result schema. There's just a result schema and a CDM schema. And that's yeah, basically. I think okay. um, I think you can go to the Atlas demo, the Odyssey.org instance of Atlas, and you can put in the correct URL with the right parameters for your database type, and you can download the DDL from there. So it is yeah. as simple, hopefully, as just putting one URL. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you ever need this DDL, it. it's easy to get to. In fact, I'm gonna, somebody opened an issue about a problem with Spark, and I'll just paste the URL here that he gave as the, this is the yeah. problem. And uh, you can play with that URL and change the dialect and other elements of the URL to get the DDL. But yeah. so Web API does try to help and tell you this is what my re result schema is. It just won't execute the schema for you because <laughs> okay. it's it's a chicken and the egg problem. How do I know the source exists to generate it on if I can't enter the C the, the source yet to point to the CDM? You know, it's it's hard. Yeah. I, I get it. I get it. Um, so I, I, yeah, do I, I'd love to see that link. Please please paste it in. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you, you so it. much for all your help. Sure thing. Thank you. I, did, I just wanted to add one quick thing because, again, probably people don't know about this, but the Atlas Demo DB does use Flyway. And what it does is it seeds the first uh, database changes and then it sets the uh, Flyway uh, variable to say this is the start of the migration. It uses the migrate, it populates the migration table that Flyway uses. So when you start up the Atlas DB, it will actually upgrade itself to the latest version. So. All right, I know. Let's talk about. Let's do the, the <laughs> demo and everything else. Sorry, Ajit, we keep interrupting you. Sure. Uh, no problem. No problem. There's there's a lot of hooks and everything. Um, right. So this this is the uh, splash page that uh, gets shown uh, because I I elected to enable showing each of these three divs. It's going to show them on the splash page. Um, so you do need to be explicit in your environment file. Uh, if you wanted to hide Aries or Hades or whatever it might be, like for instance, in my institute, in my in my company, we already have um, our studio server set up. In another location, we've elected to disable Hades um, in in our installation. But in this local one, I've chosen to to kind of show all three. Uh, you can see the uh, site is secure, and if we click on this, we can get to Atlas, um, and it you know it's going to launch from there. Um, we can also launch Aries, uh, and so this is the um, the tool I mentioned before. Relatively new, um, very interesting tool, um, and so you can explore your data sources, provided that you actually uh, ran all of the necessary steps to produce the data files uh, for Aries to show you a, a network level of sources. Um, and so this is what this report will show you, and you'll see things like the um, you know, feasibility and data strands and so forth. So um, if you want more information on Aries, then, then certainly refer to that repository. Uh, and then Hades uh, also um, is something that uh, you can launch. And so it's going to launch with the default username. There's only one account right now uh, in this uh, deployment. Uh, we're thinking about if, if we can do something more with that to add more users or potentially connect it uh, to a security provider. Um, but for now, it's a, it's really just for um, kind of getting up and running, trying things out. Um, if you're trying to do something more of a production system, uh, you probably want to, at least for now, look for a different route um, for launching Hades. Uh, so these are the these are the main uh, features of it. Um, I think that um, the simplicity of it is is really the key um, because without it, uh, you are struggling to install these things. Uh, and so what we're trying to do next is kind of tackle some of the other um, sorts of um, 
items that we may have covered a bit just now, like the multi-user support. Um, example LDAP server, actually, I got it working this morning. So um, I think we may add that as well so that you could try out security patterns um, there. Um, and then Lee, I think you wanted to talk about some of these other um, additional applications, right? Yeah, just briefly. So uh, the Odyssey Perseus is uh, it's an ETL tool. So it's a nice uh, user interface web-based tool that wraps around some of the existing uh, ETL tools. So like White Rabbit, uh, Usagi for mapping, uh, CDM Builder for actually doing the ETL conversion. And uh, currently it's got its own separate set of uh, Docker images. I think there's quite a few of them, like uh, nine or 10, because of the different tools it's using in the background. And so I really want to work to integrate that with Broadsea. So we'll have one place and you can bring up your ETL tool as well as the uh, sort of end uh, scope of the analytics piece, which you see here. So you, know, you can go away from converting your data through to analyzing your data just with Broadsea. And you know, obviously all the, the tools that people have developed. So yeah, that's one I really want to focus on and get that in before the end of the year. So that's one of my goals there. The Shiny server I just put in there as a potential. So um, a lot of the uh, Odyssey analyses uh, studies produce uh, Shiny apps. And so it would be kind of nice to have at least a local Shiny server and just put them out there or or have a, um, a local site Shiny server. So maybe you need to, to keep it internal. You want some analysis that you don't want to make public. Uh, so you don't want to put it on data.odyssey.org, which is the Shiny server for Odyssey. And so that would be a nice addition, I think. I already have a, a broad C shiny container uh, that we could integrate. Um, SQL render developer app. So that's, uh, well, go ahead. I think Ajit, you might have added that one. Yeah, these are th the next two are kind of just things that I thought might be kind of interesting to have as part of your deployment. Um, and they're right. really just for helping uh, analysts and, and kind of um, developing code. So the, there, there are already existing shiny apps, the SQL render developer app, which allows you to translate um, SQL, um, auto SQL into different dialects. Um, I find that to be quite useful. And you know, if it's not too heavy lift, we, we could look to kind of have that available. Uh, and then also the query library is also really uh, a nice um, uh, shiny app that's out there. If you haven't seen it before, it gives you a lot of standard um, Odyssey queries. So you can get things like, how do I find the drug ingredients, you know, uh, in this database or, or what are the doses for that for that drug ingredient and, and those kinds of queries. Um, so we may look at adding those since they're already established uh, and they could be useful to a, a broader audience at, at, at sites. Um, and then the, the CDM lifecycle, you know, this is where I'd like to try to do something with this because uh, I think we all kind of face the challenge. We have to come up with our own solutions in order to, um, you know, figure out how to how to get CDMs ready for use. Um, certainly you can run Achilles and, and you can kind of do some queries against your, your CDM and, and call it a day. But I think generally most sites are looking to, to have web applications and other tools available with it. Uh, so your data quality dashboard reports, your maybe your network level Aries uh, kind of view. Um, these are all easily scriptable. Uh, and I'm sure everybody has done some kind of solution for this. Uh, but if we're all facing the same challenge, then we might as well have a solution for that that is, uh, you know, uh, ties it all together. Uh, and the source management piece, you know, the results, uh, the discussion we had just a few minutes ago um, uh, with John and Chris about the um, how do I deploy these results tables? Um, right now, it's a DDL uh, that you can get from Web API and, and just kind of manually do it, or, or you could script that as well, I'm sure. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking we may want to have some kind of pattern for this so that it is, again, like a one line command you can run to basically say that I'm, I've am i got my CDM. I, I already kind of prepared all my post processing of Achilles and DQD and so forth. And I'd like to actually bring it into Atlas and have it ready to use. You know, is there some patterns we can get into for uh, establishing um, the results tables uh, in adding it to your source and source daemon tables using the APIs that are there. Uh, so that's something, uh, oh, and also adding permissions to that source as well. Um, so those are all patterns that we find time and time again, and it, you know there might be some opportunities to to automate in some fashion. I, I think uh, Ajit, um, uh, one guy that I have to add there is the archiving sources as well. So when you've moved on, you want mm -hmm. a new version. 
Um, it's I don't know that it's the one place you can go today and figure out or understand what's the, the way to remove a source and what should I do there? What should I save if I need to come back to it? Um, that would be really important. Um, I've been trying not to say it, but I feel like the um, a good answer to some of these things would be to have a broad C command line interface. So I know we could do something in Golang, which would have essentially zero dependencies. Uh, we could put something into one of the containers just so people could say broad C and then, you know, um, add user, broad C remove, uh, source, you know, things like that. So we may, if it, you know, maybe it's a broad C4 uh, version that we might do, but I think having some kind of command line, just as you have with uh, Kubernetes and those other tools where it's kind of an admin tool that you want to be able to limit people's access to, but just make things easier and have some help and you, know, you can display on, on the command line. So uh, Chris, I yeah. see you've got your, your hand raised again. So. Been patient. Oh, you yep, muted. Yep, yep. Nope, no problem. Um, wanted to ask about the Shiny Server uh, application you were thinking. You mentioned um, it's the same as Odyssey.org. So we're using Shiny environment in our own, not just Shiny, but the whole R Connect type of framework thing, where you know you publish it using the right in the UI of uh, R Studio. You can actually set up a connection and publish to like an R Connect endpoint. Shiny IO, I think, is one endpoint that's publicly oh, yeah. available free. Yeah. Um, you can also do it to your own internal environment. I'm not hugely into the IT space, so they hide things from us, so I don't know exactly how they set it up here, but is the idea behind the Shiny server, is it, I know there's, I don't know, I think there's two flavors of these sort of things. One is you copy like a Shiny app R file to a certain directory and you go to a web, like a website and based on the route, it'll launch the thing. Yep. And that's one way of doing sort of hosting shiny apps. And the other way is basically you publish the app using R connect, and then you can go to another site that gives you a dashboard of all the published applications. Is this shiny server that you're thinking of the former, which is sort of like just copy it up to a certain URL like folder on a server, or is it the latter, which is like actually integrates to an R connect uh, service? Uh, I'm not familiar with the R Connect service, but I do know that um, I guess the makers of Shiny have a commercial service you can subscribe to. It's not particularly cheap <laughs> to to use it. Um, right. So I think if you have that available uh, and someone else is paying for that within your organization, I would just go ahead and use it. Uh, but sure. it's, this one I had in mind is more the the former, where there's an open source community version of our studio. Sorry, of our Shiny. Um, and that's what we're running on data.odyssey.org. There is a third option, which is Shiny Proxy, which I think I'm going to be deploying pretty soon. I don't want to give an exact timetable, but uh, we've had some challenges around the regular uh, R Shiny server because it's single threaded. So if two people hit the same application yes. at the same time, that's going right. to be a problem. It doesn't scale well. Um, right. And we have issues with around dependencies across different Shiny apps. So. You know, someone yep. needs uh, version four of something and someone else needs version five. So you have to proxy, choose one or the other in yeah, your setup. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, yeah. we kind of have a way of having a custom library in reference, but it's it's kind of a big workaround. And mm -hmm. so that's becoming a challenge now to manage for Odyssey. So another way is to use something called Shiny Proxy. And Shiny Proxy is really nice because it's a Java application that, like you said, if you give it the right route, it will launch the Shiny app for you. But the difference is that Shiny Proxy uses uh, Docker images for each Shiny app, so mm -hmm. you can include all the dependencies for each Shiny app. Um, you have to build it as a Docker image, but um, I'm working with uh, JPEG to to maybe test some things out there. So that I'm hoping people will be able to build their own Shiny app in their own repository, and then would push to Shiny Proxy GitHub repo with with just an application file there, and it would automatically uh, pull the right Docker image into the the hosted shiny proxy. So gotcha. I probably too much detail around that, but there's a, I'm I'm moving more towards a shiny proxy solution. Uh, but in this case, it's just probably a, a shiny server, um, just with a local directory that's mapped in. You can just drop your shiny apps there. Yeah, if it's a local hosted say, thing that one user's primarily using it, yeah. you don't really have to worry about 
whatever. Yeah. But I think odyssey.org must be suffering. J and J is suffering because we have like 20 scientists on different versions of R and, yeah. and one update. will ha- And it's not even that it's the entire organization outside of our department. So the more people involved in it, the more risk you have of changing a version of a dependency to blow everybody up, which has happened. Yeah. So it's yeah. cool. What you're describing doesn't have to be that crazy leaf um, robust because you're probably thinking single user use, which is fine. I just yeah. was asking about R Connect because it does seem to be a standardized approach for publishing, and I wasn't sure. But you're right; it I, is I will, expensive if you want to buy it. Look, well, let me let me add that uh, something that I'm I'm kicking around is actually the second approach with RS Connect, um, but it is a server a licensed kind of approach. Um, so, I mean, if you do have an mm-hmm. RS Connect license, you could bring it right to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe there's a, a free RS Connect, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, but I know that. We're interested at BI of having a Docker Dockerized RS Connect uh, using our, our license. And so I started on this. I, I'm waiting for my license from my IT partner so I can try this. Um, but if it works, this could be, and this is kind of the nice thing about profiles, right? Is that you you don't have to order everything off the menu. You can just pull what you want. So if you're a shop that has um, RS Connect license, maybe you could deploy that using this profile. Um, if you're not, you could use sort of the free, you know, shiny server where you just sort of drop in files kind of approach. Um, so I'm not committing to it yet. I'm, I still need to test it, but this is just something I've, I was about to play with um, today. So I, I think um, really the, the nice thing yeah. here is it's an ecosystem there, right? If someone wants to, um, you know, give us or push in to this uh, repo, mm-hmm. this is an, another profile for something they're interested in. So, you know, I would like to to have the open source shiny option as well though because i feel like we should first of all support open source options that are free and then uh, we mm-hmm. can add on commercial things to that but i did see some things in the chat so um i think sanjay you you asked about jupiter lab jupiter notebook um did you want to talk about that oh no just sorry um just responding to dr martin on this side channel of chat um okay yeah that's an area that um may also be a view utility um uh, because of um its integration with python and and r um I so agree. yeah thank yeah. you go ahead so again you know maybe we'll have another profile that includes that in the future yeah exactly and that's why and that's why i'm if it weren't for profiles i think i'd be hesitant to add commercial type stuff, considering this is Odyssey. Um, but I think if we have, you know, um, open source kind of uh, things that anyone can pick up and run, and there's also options um, for if you do want to productionize and maybe you do have uh, a commercial kind of license, then you could you could do that. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. OK, I'll just uh, check. And I time. just. Um, so oh, I just, I just, one thing I, I just was, I wanted to make sure I was clear is that everything with traffic, uh, you know, again, you get these routes for each one of these services. So you, everything that you deploy is behind your host name. Um, so my, my work, back, my um, Postgres instance, right? This is behind my local um, URL here. Um, so the nice thing about it is that you do have these very specific kind of um endpoints for each one of these uh, services that are there um i think i see some suggestions coming in so we've got uh duck db yeah switch over to the chat uh, what would be the best way for us to collect this maybe if people can create um issues on the the broad c github repo just with some suggestions on things they'd like to see things hopefully they really need uh, not sort of nice to haves but Things that would really you know benefit the community as well it'd be great to capture some ideas on what additional applications we'd like to support okay. at least i'll capture those of the things we just discussed but yeah certainly i think it would be great to uh to bring it into the the github repo uh and I'll also mention the discord uh and yep. uh, Sanjay, are you in the line? Do you want to just say a few words about the Discord? Yes. Hi, um, everyone. Please, uh, I, I uh, invite you to join. What we're using um, in Discord for is a um, kind of a beta environment to have uh, rapid conversations uh, around issues that you may be facing. Um, we stood it up, um, and 
Ajit has been enormously helpful um, and others are invited to come uh, get questions answered in a in a fashion that uh, may be very akin to what you're used to in in the forums, but just with a, a little bit more um, interactivity, we've seen that the forums can uh, a thread can dead end and then two years later someone can come up with a solution. So we're hoping uh, that this will be an adjunct to the forum um, and uh, assist everyone in the community with um, you know kind of more real time um, interactivity. So um, please join us. And Sanjay. OK, I, I see. Um, John, you, you have your hand raised and then I think um, I'd like to open up as well just for anyone else that hasn't spoken on the call after John's talked. Uh, just give people one more opportunity if you have questions. Go ahead, John. Sure. Um, th thanks, Sanjay, for all your help on the forums. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, what's Discord? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's basically Someone's not like, a gamer. Yeah, yeah it, it was born out of the gamer community, but now organizations are using it like a, a version of free Slack, but it, okay. it offers a lot more, um, you know, ch channel interactivity, moderation, uh, assisting each other with uh, finding answers. And so we've organized it to be exactly like the, the forums with the topics, uh, you know, welcome, um, you know, arrivals and departures, introduce yourself. And then the help section is implementation, development, research, CDM development, um, just as the forums are organized. So it should be pretty familiar to find what you're looking for, or find people that can help in those areas. Awesome. So I got to get a Discord account and then how do I connect to it? Do you have like a URL or something or a handle? That yeah, you can either you can either do it as you're seeing um, Ajit, you can do it right in your web browser, or you can uh, download the the app to your um, to your computer. Uh, either way, yeah, but uh, it's very straightforward. If you've got uh, Google or whatever as your account, uh, primary personal account, and, just use that. And what's the group I'm going to need to join? Um, it's, it's in the, forums, the okay. yeah, it's right on the, the forums. Yeah, yeah, it's what? It's right in here. The forums, um, there's a post. Yeah, we'll paste the URL. Can you oh, paste okay. the URL okay. uh, G, yeah. to that uh, announcement? Sure. Okay, if I yeah. just search on Discord in the uh, in the forum, I'll find it. Yeah. Eh, yeah, we got it right here for you. There you go. Okay. Oh, thanks. You go. Any last uh, comments, thoughts, feedback from anyone else on the call? Because I think we'll be finishing in a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully, this has been informative for people. I see someone has their hand raised. Go ahead. Hello guys, uh, I'm Saidalip and like I'm Thanks, just man. new to this community, like uh, from past three months I've been there. Like for my uh, organization, I have started uh, this Broadsea setup and first of all, thank you for this, uh, for your Broadsea. It's so much helpful, like it reduced, uh, like previously in this ODC in the box, like individually I have started installing, it took for me nearly one and a half month, but I got struggling that. But later uh, due to Broadsea, I could figure that at some part. And after that, uh, the uh, issue what I'm facing, like it, it defaultly we are getting through that demo database where everything goes fine. Like if I want to get that uh, like, uh, Postgres, like external database connected to this uh, broad C, uh, there the issue I'm facing, like uh, I in my external, like I'll just tell what are the features I am having. Like uh, you can suggest me so that uh, I can make that uh, uh, better. Like uh, in my uh, uh, external database, like which is Postgres, I have the CDM schema, CDM schema, result schema, and as well as vocabulary schema. But uh, this uh, web API schema is present in this broad C, which is, uh, which comes with the default everything. Like now, uh, when I try to load the data, like I'm uh, doing all the details well through a source daemon and source. Uh, so, uh, source also but uh, even after the refresh like uh, we have you have uh, given some uh, urls where we can find out whether our connections were uh, made correctly or not we can cross check kind of thing like refresh web api using that url i'm getting that exactly same but when but my data is not reflecting atlas uh, atlas like when i go to atlas uh, data sources by my data is not uh, replicating there 
even uh, I, I have populated this Achilles uh, one, which is uh, which we usually populate in this result schema so that we can display uh, it displays in the Atlas our uh, dashboards and everything. Everything is working fine, but uh, data is not reflecting the Atlas one. Like I need suggestions kind of thing like uh, should I have this web API in my uh, uh, external database or uh, what should I do like? Yeah, I'm wondering if this might be a caching issue perhaps because like I have cleared the con configuration cache also, but uh, I okay. couldn't able to solve that issue like uh, internally with these setups like what are the CDM configuration steps were provided. I have followed everything. Like I am not facing any issue regarding like if you have faced the issue like uh, when you yeah, has you guys provided an uh, your URL link which has web, web API refresh where we add the uh, source daemon and uh, source one. We we couldn't able to find what are the things we are adding like for external thing when we add to web API we wouldn't able to find that but I am able to find that what are the things we are I am adding like all my uh, database sectional database details and uh, CDM uh, schema details and everything. Yeah, what what uh, they can, they can, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Dudley. No, go ahead. Uh, side Dudley, uh, we can definitely uh, maybe assist you know one to one on the on the channel uh, on the Discord. So um, we totally understand that you're facing what many others have, have faced. It's a, it's a learning curve and there's usually a solution that's not evident immediately. So you're welcome to please come talk to us there and maybe we'll let others uh, talk about their backgrounds and, and their uh, questions. Thanks. Doug. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity. Thanks. That's a good question. Like uh, if you don't mind, I have another question also. Well, like I, think, I just finish I it. We'll, for... uh, I think we'll stop there just because we um, uh, want to be careful about other people's times and, and everyone yeah. you know, has, has dedicated a lot of time here. But um, I think those are probably, you know, it's going to be questions that a lot of people have. I think it's going to be unique questions. So we do want to have a place to, to answer some of that. So um, I think some of it might be additional documentation on the Broadsea GitHub repo. Uh, there's a Discord, as mentioned, and also the forums. I think some of us will be a little more active on the forums now that we have uh, Road C 3.0 out. Uh, so hopefully you'll get a little bit more response there as well. So uh, Ajit, did you want Thank to finish you. up? Uh, did you have any last uh, things you wanted to talk about? Um, just, you know, again, I think we're welcoming all new ideas, um, any issues that are, that you uh, run into. I mean, as I mentioned, there's some areas that no, nobody knows all of the stack. I mean, maybe Chris does, but rest of us don't. Yeah, maybe. Um, so I think we. So I think we. I think if there's uh, areas like security providers, you know, if you're using something that's not LDAP or AD, maybe there's some changes we need to do there, right? Um, and then in terms of ideas of new things we can bring, um, I think one of the things that we that Lee and I discussed, you know, after introducing 3.0 is that now we have profiles. Um, should we look to kind of um, change the way we do the other broad C repos? You know, we had dedicated broad C repos for web tools and for Achilles and all these other things. Should we instead have one um, broad C repo and have profiles so you can pick and choose what you want? Um, so I think we're still kind of kicking that idea around and, and how that might work. Um, and there's a lot of um, software out there in Odyssey that that needs to be Dockerized and, and hasn't been so far. So Aries Indexer. DQD, you know, et cetera. Um, so I think there's still some work to do to, um, you know, get those in order. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, by year end, you know, we can have, um, you know, a lot of these things handled through one, um, you know, broad C implementation, and you can just pick and choose the profiles that you want. Um, but again, the idea is that we really want to make this so that you could use it on your laptop, you could make a dev server, you make a production server. It's going to make a lot of sites lives easier uh, and hopefully some sites out there will will be able to convince their IT departments to allow Docker <laughs> because it's way easier. <laughs> yeah, they, well, I, I just want to say thanks again, Ajit, for all your hard work to get Broad C 3.0 uh, done. It was just, uh, when when you uh, showed it to me, I was just really, like, really impressed. That, and it's great that now we've got multiple people that are really sort of core to Broad C. It can live on and, and evolve more. So. Uh, thanks for all your work on that. Oh, thanks, Lee. Thanks for starting this. All right, I think we'll finish up now. Uh, it's 2.15. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join us today and, and get this introduction to Broad 3.0. Enjoy the rest of your day. That's everyone. Thanks, all.
Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.